the objectives of the ASEAN economic community are four. One is one market. Second is competitive. Third one is to be equitable among ourselves, inclusive. And the fourth one is to be able to be integrated into the global market seamlessly. And I would say, I think we are concentrating on the first one. How to bring down all barriers, how to open up all areas, not only goods flowing, but also skilled labor flowing cross borders, and then open up areas of services, areas of investment uh, between us and among us. And we have found out that countries that have developed to a certain degree will have some resistance. Countries that have not had much to protect are more willing to uh, open up because they want more and they have less to protect. So uh, we are going full force on market integration. And then in order to really have one market uh, integrated, you need financial integration. You need financial services that could help uh, move and help uh, propel the economic integration, the real economic uh, activities going forward without financial integration, without uh, opening up your uh, banking and finance services, your stock market to each other. Uh, it would be very difficult to see one uh, effective integrated market, 600 million people. And that is our attraction. When we can promise to potential investors that you come to invest in one, you have the other nine markets and you have the entire 600 million growing middle class and uh, growing purchasing power. We have to get there and we have three years, less than three years to do it. But I can say we are on course. We will do adjustment, cost adjustment along the way, but the general direction is very clear. Well, the EU, for example, is our uh, largest market for export. Uh, it's not our largest trading partner, but certainly our largest export. And it is the largest source of FDI into ASEAN. Uh, about 20 plus percent of all FDI into ASEAN has come from and continues to come from the EU, in spite of everything that the EU is going through. Now, um, we certainly would like to continue to be the a target of investment from the EU. We don't want to be the receiving end of all the problems that the EU is experiencing, but we have been assured uh, by no less person than the President of the Commission, Mr. Barroso, that uh, the markets are responding well. He said that uh, we are uh, back in, in business and uh, we can certainly help contain some of the fires that could spill over into the larger region of, uh, of, of Europe. So we do hope that the EU will get over its problem soon because eventually whatever we produce here, whatever parts that we would send to China into the factories, put them into finished products, eventually the markets would be in Europe and in America. So we would like to see Europe and America uh, going coming out of there problems as soon as possible. The combined GDP here is uh, close to 2 trillion. I would say about 2 trillion. And uh, the trade figure is also about the same because uh, we import, we export, sometimes we export other people's products. So our GDP and our trade figures are quite the same or similar. And then uh, we trade among ourselves about 25% of that 2 trillion US dollars trade volume combined. That is a challenge for ASEAN and that's what we are working on. Uh, so we have to uh, work on the financial integration in order to promote and propel further trade uh, integration, uh, economic integration, and uh, we need to increase it to the level that would justify all of us being called a community or calling ourselves an economic community. NAFTA 
uh, with uh, Mexico, Canada and the US, the volume of trade between and among themselves, three countries, is 48% and 50%. Uh, the EU, for 27 countries, is about 70%, 60 plus, about 70. ASEAN is only one fourth of all our trade with the world. We need to work on that. So we are concentrating on the SMEs, crossing borders, investing in each other. We are trying to, as I said, uh, also doing financial integration so that it could serve as the foundation for further growth among us and between us. Our middle class is definitely expanding. How to get them to spend more? Because the savings here are very high, over 40%. Uh, which is different from Europe and America, it's minus 40-50% spending into the, into the red. We here have a lot of savings and we want to mobilize the savings either into spending or into investments. And uh, we know what we need to do. And I think the ministers and the leaders understand the challenge and we are moving very steadily in the direction that we can be a partner to all uh, trading partners from around the world, the EU, the US, and the rest of the world. I think ASEAN or members of ASEAN are lucky in the sense that we are at different stages of economic development. Some of us are very good as production base, manufacturing uh, base, and exporting out to the world, but many of us are still exporting commodities. So I think investment in transforming those raw materials and commodities into a value-added class of uh, items of products would be very, very uh, good prospect into the future, whether it's the rubber, whether it's minerals all across the region, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia and definitely Myanmar is opening up. I think rather than just extracting and prospecting all those on all those minerals and resource, natural resources, I think some of these countries can frog leap into manufacturing, into processing and making finished products out of those commodities that we have. I think that is a very, very good potential for the future for the foreign direct investment coming in. Service industry in the region is very, very competitive, certainly in tourism. We have about 60 plus, almost 70 million coming into the 10 countries of ASEAN every year, and that number can be increased. So in hospitality industry, in hotels, in various um, areas of services for travel, for tourism, for health uh, will be here. Very, very, uh, I think, very promising. The area of education. The middle class expanding, as I said, uh, with rising purchasing power, are looking for better education for their children and they are willing to invest. And there are some universities who are putting up campuses here and doing very well. And some are just coupling, being sister organizations, a lot from the UK, some from the US, some from Australia. I think this is another area of growth, education. Health, I mean, health tourism in, in, in ASEAN is very, very attractive. A lot of people from the Gulf region are coming here. Uh, because it's, I think the standard is as good as anywhere in the world, but certainly uh, the price is lower, and at the same time they can have family vacation uh, to 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 also enjoy. So in the health area, and a lot of Western uh, companies, Western uh, groups are advising, consulting operating uh, these um, hospitals 
with first-rate, um, state-of-the-art technology, medical technology. Uh, I think that's another area of growth here. When you want to talk about economic community, you can't get away from the sector of logistics, transport, infrastructure, because you want to produce goods and you want to produce services that people will have easy access to and uh, the goods and the products are transported uh, uh, rather uh, effectively from the factories to the market to the consumers. We have found ourselves wanting that when we want to create this community, we have found out that we are not very well connected infrastructure-wise and institutional norms and uh, standards and quality of our products, of our services. We need to improve on those things and we need to also encourage people to, to move, to cross borders. So logistics is an area of enormous uh, uh, promise for anybody who would want to come in and do investment. From ratification to implementation is a challenge, just like in Europe. Uh, of all the agreements and protocols and treaties that we have made on the economic front, I think we have been able to ratify about 70 plus percent and we have told the leaders, we have told the, um, the ministers, uh, all the officials that you better get going uh, ratifying all of them because without ratification you can't implement. And on top of that, those that have been ratified need to be put into practice. You need to implement them because you need enabling legislation you need to reform your laws, your regulations, your rules, sometime at the ministerial level, sometime at the departmental level, sometime even at the regional provincial level, so that you can really open up the space for each other. Um, but again, 70% ratification is not bad, and the leaders know, and the ministers know, and the officials know, and the private sector is putting their the pressure on all of us that uh, ratification, yes, good, but implement it, really open it, and make it easy for us to move, make it easy for us to, to, to buy and to trade and to invest in each other's markets. Otherwise, it won't be one market. Otherwise, we can't attract external parties to come and invest if we can't really deliver one integrated market by the time of 2015. And we are very much committed to that.